يا دكتور ابي حداد كابتن فيليب بيل حضورنا الكريم من اهل الصحافه والاعلام والمهتمين بهذا الحدث الثقافي والحضاري اهلا وسهلا بكم من جديد على الفور سنبدا نجتمع هنا للتعرف على صاحب النظريه القبطان فيليب بيل الذي وصل الى لبنان بدعوه من الجمعيه الدوليه للمحافظه على صور وبدعوة من رئيستها الدكتورة مها الخليل شلبي لما لهذا الحدث من أهمية بالنسبة للبنان الحضري ووجه لبنان الحضري نبدأ فورا بكلمة الدكتور حادة تفضل شكرا Honorable guests Ambassadors, representatives uh, on behalf of President uh, Joseph Jabra, who could not, unfortunately, join us today, I would like to welcome you all uh, to this interesting event, which has been organized by uh, LAU in collaboration with the uh, Organization for the Preservation of Tire, represented by uh, Dr. Maha Khalil Shalabi. I want to thank uh, Dr. Shalabi for this initiative and to thank all of you for uh, coming on this Friday uh, the 13th in the evening to witness maybe a very interesting and uh, provocative uh, lecture about our ancestors. Uh, I will not introduce uh, Captain Beal, I think uh, he will do that. Dr. Amaha will do it. Uh, but uh, suffice to say that uh, we share a common heritage with uh, Captain Beal. Uh, he's fascinated by the Phoenicians and by their ships. And our ship is on the uh, logo of LAU and has been, uh, since the establishment of LAU, it has gone through multiple transformation from a triary to a simple uh, one-row ship. And so we have something in common with uh, Captain Bill. So on behalf, again, of President Jabra, I would like to welcome you all and wish you a happy uh, event. Thank you. الآن نستمع إلى كلمة الدكتورة مها خليل شلبي للتعريف في البحار والبحاثة في الفيديو. أيها الأصدقاء الأعزاء ممثلي معالي الوزراء وبعض السفراء. أه حاتكلم بالانجليزيه حتى صديقنا فيليب كابتن فيليب يقدر يستوعب شو عم نقول. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you for sharing this event with us. I would like to thank Dr. Jabra, President of LAU, who is out of the country and couldn't join us today. As well, I want to thank Dr. Haddad, Dr. Abyad, for their valuable help hosting this conference to promote the heritage of Lebanon. It's a great honor that I stand before you here today at the start of the year 2017 to launch a very special project, Expedition Crossing the Atlantic with Captain Bill Philip Bell. Please come to the floor. Some 7,000 years ago, a great nation was born in modern-day Lebanon, made of pioneers in many domains. The Phoenicians, our ancestors, inventors of the alphabet, the purple dye, blown glass, were the first global traders. They were blessed with green mountains covered with cedar trees, which gave them solid wood and made them master chip builders and the most outstanding seafarers of their time. 
They connected the three continents of the Mediterranean basin to the sheer top cliffs of southwest England. These are facts. Despite what has been written and published, little is known about the Phoenicians and a lot yet to be revealed. One of our mission at the International Association to Save Tyre is to encourage and endorse all archaeological research that shed light on how much the world owes the Phoenicians. Now I ask you, did the Phoenicians discover a fourth continent? Did the greatest sailors of ancient times have capabilities to cross the Atlantic Oceans? You may say no. I say, why not? One man decided to prove that the Phoenicians had indeed crossed the Atlantic and the first to discover the new world. And our association will go above and beyond to support this endeavor. <coughs> this man is Captain Bill Beer with a big courage to cross the continent. And it's a dangerous mission, of course. And we appreciate this endeavor, really. And we thank him a lot for this commitment. Let us welcome together former British Navy, great adventurer and instigator of this exhibition, Captain Philip Hicks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, LAU, for allowing us to be here today. Uh, Captain Philip B, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like you to know that there will be a Q&A at the end of the lecture, so you'll be able to ask Captain Philip any questions you may have. So I'd like to start, Captain Philip, by asking you, how did your story with the Phoenicians begin? Okay, and I'd just like to say before I start, um, thank you again to LAU and also to the International Association to Save Tire your fantastic hospitality this week. Um, it's very much appreciated. So, yes, how did I get involved in this whole area? Well, I was lucky enough when I was 17 years old to go onto an expedition in the Pacific on a sailing ship and visit some of the islands and I saw the traders on their little canoes taking uh, great voyages from island to island and it really inspired me to think, you know, this is how cultures move from one island to another, from one country to another, and from one continent to another. And that's what so inspired me. And really, for the rest of my life, I've been pursuing this interest in cultural migrations through navigation and through boats. Which brings us to our second question. What is the purpose of your visit? What are you doing in Lebanon today? Okay, so uh, the purpose of me being here in the, in the Lebanon is, uh, first of all, we have uh, signed um, an agreement with the International Association to Save Tyre to work together to promote uh, the Phoenician history and culture and to help launch this expedition so that really we restore you know, the Phoenician culture to its proper place in history. So I think it has been, you know, certainly by international commentators and historians, it's been very much underplayed, underappreciated. Yes, so this will bring us to the first part of your lecture today. Can you tell us how did you come up with the idea of building a Phoenician boat? How did the entire story start? What, what happened was I had... Um, done a voyage uh, from Indonesia uh, looking at how um, Asian culture had influenced 
Africa. This was in 2003. We built a double outrigger canoe, sailed it across the Indian Ocean to show how Madagascar and uh, the Asian culture had influenced Madagascar and East Africa. And then I was looking at, well, who were the first people to trade um, with Africa? Who were the first people to circumnavigate Africa? And then I came across the reference that Herodotus had said the Phoenicians made the first circumnavigation of Africa. And I was talking with a, uh, an academic friend at Oxford University, and he said, Philip, this is your next project. This is what you should do. You should build a Phoenician ship and sail it around Africa and show that it could have been done. And that's what we did uh, with uh, the help of many people here and elsewhere. In 2010, uh, we completed it and, and came back here. Could you please show us the details of the ship building and the ancient ways of yeah. So, the first part then I will do uh, is just to talk to you about how we actually built the ship and how we did the voyage. It's because we've got quite a lot to get through, because I also want to talk about the theories of the Phoenicians sailing uh, to the Americas, and I also want to talk to you about the plans of the expedition. So I'm just going to pick out a few highlights of the building of the ship, just to give you the, the background first. So. There was a lot of research involved, and we uh, found a 6th century uh, wreck, and we got access to the information for that wreck, to, for the, if you like, the designs for the building. And in 2005, I came to the Lebanon and to Syria to look for wooden boat builders that could build the ship. And Unfortunately, as you know, in 2006, it wasn't possible to build the ship here, so we built it uh, in Arwad, in, near Tartus, in, in Syria. And uh, the next few slides show uh, this is the keel uh, being laid, um, which was done in uh, late 2007, and the first pegs being put into the keel. And here... Uh, you see the first planks being um, assembled. And what you notice um, at the side here are the dowels that are being driven into the planks. And these dowels are locking uh, pegs that connect all the planks together. So this makes a very, very strong uh, construction. And it's this construction of this what the, the Romans called the Phoenician joints. It's, it's this construction that enabled the Phoenicians to have the strongest ships, and that underpinned the fantastic trade that they were able to do because they were more reliable and they became better seamen because they had this fantastic uh, construction. And they really pioneered this technique. This is the if you like, the shell of the ship uh, in, in uh, Arwad. And what you notice here is that it's built in the ancient way. They put the keel and all the planks together first, and only later do they add the ribs for more strength. So this is, if you like, they built on the basis of a canoe and added more and more and got bigger and bigger, and then they put the, uh, as I say, the ribs in, in, in later. This is not how ships are built today. The modern way of building a ship, a wooden boat, is to make the skeleton first, and then they put the planks on. So we had to actually teach the boat builders in our way the ancient techniques. Then uh, they put the ribs in and the structure to make it even stronger. And one of the things about the Phoenicians, they were the first... Uh, boat builders to use iron nails. They didn't use a lot of iron nails, but where the, the ribs were, they supported them with some additional iron nails, which gave it extra strength. And some of these nails were, you know, 10 inches long. And here she is. This is what she looked like when she first went uh, into the water after about nine months of, of being built. 
uh, beautiful shape, um, and you know today she is really the only um, sailing Phoenician ship that that exists. I'm just going to show you a very short clip of her sailing as she basically uh, finished the circumnavigation of Africa coming into into Gibraltar. And I think you'll agree, it's a you know, fantastic sight. Could you please tell us the type of wood that was used to build that ship? Was it cedar wood, like the Phoenicians used to do? Yes, so uh, we kept true to the ancient techniques. We used the woods that would only have been available in the ancient times. So we used a, a cedar for the keel, and then a Mediterranean pine for the planks. All the pegs were olive wood, and the ribs, uh, most of it was Mediterranean oak, which was used in ancient times for the ribs. But we ran out of oak, so we also used walnut, and, and the walnut was also used as a wood in, in ancient times. So, uh, yeah, that's a number of different woods. I know mean, I've just missed one, and that's uh, the cypress fir. We used the cypress fir for the mast and the boom because it's much more flexible and it can take the, you know, the pressure of the sail. So that's uh, just a little bit of a clip for you to see what we're really talking about and whether these kinds of ships could have sailed across to the Americas. So just a very quick um, resume of the, the voyage around Africa. I'm just going to mention a couple of uh, pieces of information. The whole journey took two years to do, partly because we had some problems initially in the Red Sea. Uh, we missed our winds and currents in the Gulf of Aden, so we had to stay there six months until uh, the right winds came again, so that delayed us a bit. But nevertheless, it took two years to, to sail around Africa. We weren't sailing all the time. We were in port some of the time. But I just want to pick up two little things for you to think about. One is, of course, we were doing this in 2009. And you may remember what was happening in 2009 around the, the Horn of Africa. Um, this was the height of the piracy, the Somali pirates. They were taking ships pretty much every day, taking the crews and taking them hostage and keeping them in caves for as long or until such times as their relatives you know, raised enough money to uh, relieve, get them released. So it was a, you know, uh, quite a worrying thing to have to sail around the Horn of Africa. But as you can imagine, I had spent five years doing all the research and the work, and although several people said, you're mad if you're going to sail across with these pirates, I said, well, you know, we spent so much time organizing this expedition, I can't stop, we're just going to do it. And we got uh, to the Yemen, and then we went down towards uh, Madagascar and run the gauntlet of these uh, pirates. And the problem is, that when you see an Arab dhow like this that's coming towards you, you just don't know whether they're going to jump on board and take you hostage or not. You just can't tell. And so you have your satellite phone ready to, you know, to make the emergency call to get help, but you know help probably won't come, um, but you have the number anyway. So this is a very terrifying sort of time. We do take uh, satellite communications. So we had, we knew where the the attacks were taking place uh, every day, and we avoid, we tried to avoid them and change the direction that we were sailing to get a, away from them. And in one case, you know, we had an attack within a hundred miles of us, as we, you know, a hundred miles ahead, and we would have been right where the pirates were had we not changed course. So that was one of the, you know, the excitements, if you like, of the expedition. The other, if you like, highlight or the you know, most worrying thing was 
sailing around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, a lot of large ships have uh, come to grief going around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. It's feared by sailors. And um, we had to sail around it. And so what I'm going to show you now is just a very short clip of us sailing around the, 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 um, the Cape of Good Hope. And you'll also see, which is of, always of interest to some people, is, is how, what toilets and facilities we have on board. And you'll see a lady just getting out of the toilet, and then she gets soaked with a lot of um, water that comes over the, the bow. So let me just show you that now. on board the expedition around the African continent? Uh, generally we had about 10 to 15 people. Uh, around the Cape we actually had 15 uh, sailors on board. Uh, here's the lady, just, she's just finished her business with the toilet. <laughs> and then she gets soaking wet. But you can see it was quite rough here. There were three of us uh, trying to steer the boats here. Um, and uh, we also had to try and get, you know, away from some of the big cargo ships that were coming around the Cape as well. So, um, reasonably challenging, but it was actually a really good sail. And you'll see in a second, we had a, we put a storm sail up because our main sail had broken the night before. So we actually went around the Cape on this little green storm sail. That was sufficient because the winds were so strong. They were about 30 to 40 knots. And we went through and around the Cape on that. So that was just a little bit of an insight for two parts of what was effectively a two-year journey around Africa. We then came back through the Mediterranean, and the picture that you can see in front of you is uh, the ship at anchor in Sidon, just down the road. And here is a more uh, picturesque uh, picture of Phoenicia um, in, in Sidon. So, that was the first part of the presentation I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Philip. So many people, so many scientists, have speculated whether the Phoenicians had crossed the Atlantic Ocean and discovered the Americas. What do you think about these theories? And do you have some theories of your own on the matter? What is it that you believe in, actually? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. I think there are, and there have been many people who've put forward theories. There have been several books written about, you know, the Phoenicians crossing the Atlantic, getting to the Americas. And there are many very interesting glimpses of information. But right now, there isn't any what I would call silver bullet. There isn't a definitive piece of information that says absolutely. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about some interest, really interesting things, but there isn't a definitive proof. And that's really why we're doing the expedition, because the expedition allows people to get really interested in it, and I'm sure that over the next 5, 10, 15 years, the evidence that we're looking for you know, will will come about. Shall I explain a little please, bit? Please, please. So what I've done here is um, I've just listed 
some of the, the people who've written about the Phoenicians crossing the Atlantic to the Americas. There's uh, Thomas Johnson. There's quite a lot of stories uh, about the Phoenicians going to Brazil. There are uh, inscriptions that have been put forward. Um, however, the, the problem with, for example, the Brazilian inscriptions is that the skeptics sort of think that it's a fake, that it's a forgery. And you can argue it one way, you can argue it another way. But it's, for the skeptics, for the academic scientists, it's not conclusive proof. Um, there's a gentleman called Barry Fowl. He talked about the Phoenicians um, and made some <coughs> arguments about the Aztecs and the Incas. But again, actually, he was derided, really, and if you read his Wikipedia sort of reference, it basically sort of says, you know, uh, and by the way, some of his peers thought he was a fraud. So, probably not the most reliable uh, source of information. And um, we've got a couple of others. I'll just flick through them. Um, we have um, Hank Sudoff, who wrote the book... Um, in, in German, but sorry, Columbus, and a lot of the information there is quite interesting. The sort of what I call the sort of based on mainly cultural diffusion and similarities between Phoenician cultures and what's found in uh, Mexico today. But, you know, it's very interesting stuff, um, but again, nothing really concrete that the skeptics will accept. Um, this is another example. Um, some, biggest, some would say this is, is, this is proof. Um, Professor Mark McKenna, uh, he, he discovered that on one, at least one uh, set of Phoenician coins, gold coins from Carthage, there appeared to be a map of Europe and America at the foot of the coin. <coughs> And, but it's absolutely tiny. But then the Phoenicians did use groups of um, uh, engravers uh, that had like a, a stigmatism in their eye that could that almost like could magnify and see and, and work in great detail. So it's not beyond the possibility. But again, the skeptics will say, well, you know, you can't really say 100% that this could just be the edge of the coin being a little bit, a little bit muddled in the, in, the, in the dark. So it's not conclusive. It's, it's interesting, but it's, it doesn't really get us where we want. But I think there are some areas that are really interesting. And the first one I want to talk about is the Azores. And then we might talk a little bit about um, DNA and um, sort of the botanical influences. Why do I mention the Azores? Well, here the, are the map of, of Europe and the Azores. And the Azores is about 900 miles into the Atlantic. It's a third of the way across. And what you have to understand, if I can put it like that, is how the winds and the currents work. And remember that in a Phoenician boat like Phoenicia, Phoenicia can only sail one, really, one direction. A little bit of latitude either side, but it has to go with the wind. It cannot, like a modern yacht with a triangular sail, it can't go into the wind. It has to go with the wind. So if you have a look at this next um, slide here, uh, this, by the way, uh, was drawn by um, Benjamin Franklin, the President of the United States. Very, very clever man. Uh, he invented a lot of things. He's, um, the use of electricity is attributed to him. He was a scientist. He was a great guy. He had these incredible interests, as well as going on to become President of the United States. I mean, I might say that you know, the caliber of uh, 
Benjamin Franklin was uh, infinitely superior to the current president and president-elect of, of America. Um, but he understood the Gulf Stream. And what this shows you is the way the currents and also the winds go around the Atlantic. And if we look um, back at the picture of the Azores, if it was colonized, it would mean that the Phoenicians would have had to approach it from the American side because you couldn't sail directly. In fact, when the Portuguese discovered it, they actually uh, arrived at it by on a return voyage from Nigeria because they had to go sail around because you can't sail up to Gibraltar because the winds are against you. So it seems to me that if there was evidence of colonization of the Azores, that would be a step in the right direction. And when I first proposed this theory to some of the guys at the British Museum, they said, oh, Philip, there's no evidence of um, colonization of the Azores. There are stories, but there's no evidence. In spite of the fact that the Portuguese explorers who discovered it said they found some inscriptions there that they, did, they couldn't read and they didn't understand. But the, uh, so the Portuguese government pretty much to this day, do not want to confirm any Phoenician influence there because um, they want to, it, you know, they're embarrassed by the fact that they, it would undermine the Portuguese claims to be, uh, you know, tremendous European explorers. So you can imagine um, my interest when two things happened. Uh, just two or three years ago, a group of archaeologists from Portugal discovered, or they claim to have discovered, uh, both um, Phoenician or Carthaginian, I should say, which I take to be the same thing, the Carthaginians from Tunisia being Phoenicians, uh, Carthaginian temples and burial chambers. And, as I say, some of the Portuguese authorities are not hurrying to endorse this work and more money is needed to do more research. But it does look like that the Phoenicians did colonize the Azores. And the other piece of evidence that, uh, funnily enough, I didn't have it confirmed until yesterday was that there was a pot of Carthaginian coins that were found a couple of hundred years ago um, in Corvo on the most uh, westerly island of the Azores and they went uh, I think to the king of Spain and then a, a Swedish uh, coin collector got hold of them and he wrote a paper about these coins and said they were Carthaginian and this was proof that the, the, there was about nine coins and then as my understanding was um, that they had got lost and you couldn't actually say that there was evidence there. But anyway, yesterday I was with uh, Dr. Anton Carr, who is in the audience here, and his new book actually says that two of these coins are actually in, yeah, here's the book, a bit of publicity, um, great book, two of these coins are actually in Beirut University. And so there is actually uh, a paper trail to evidence the, because I thought they had sort of disappeared and it was just a story. So that's interesting. The other thing I'd just like to, to mention then is um, we are discovering more and more uh, archaeological information every day. I've put here um, a couple of coins, or sorry, the, the pictures here is just of a coin that was found in the southwest of England near Bristol uh, a year ago. And when I asked uh, five years ago, we were going to sail the ship back to England, I asked the Cornish Museum, uh, would they be interested in, in you know, uh, working with us to, uh, you know, ensure that people realize that the Phoenicians came to the southwest of England? Because it's written in history books, 
And what they said was, no, there's no, no uh, definitive proof that they did. Absolutely no definitive proof. So I was very delighted, you know, last year when these, uh, this coin was found, that not only the Cornish Museum, but the British Museum confirmed it and said, yeah, we totally believe that the Phoenicians traded with the Southwest. I mean, so in a period of a few years, they had actually changed their mind for the fact that these, this coin was found after a flood, it was on a major trade route, and they said, yeah, we, we believe this now. So my point here is that uh, a little bit of new evidence can change thinking a great deal. And we have to remember that it was only 60 years ago that the settlement that the Vikings made in Newfoundland was discovered. Up until that point, nobody believed that the Vikings had reached North America. It was just, no, there's no evidence. Then a group of archaeologists found this little settlement, and now everybody believes that a thousand years ago, the Vikings reached North America. There's lots of little pieces of information that are very interesting, but we don't have, if you like, the final piece of information. And what we're hoping with this expedition is we're going to get more you know, categorical information. Um, you know, what are these pieces of information? Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, one, of, one of them, um, there is an Assyrian relief, for example, from the 7th century BC, and it's got a pineapple on it. Now, a pineapple, you know, it only came from the New World, and it certainly didn't come after Columbus because it's on a 7th century BC relief. So why won't you know, the world accept that this is... I mean, the academics that have looked at it said it's unmistakably a pineapple. In fact, you know, I was lucky enough to have a pineapple for breakfast, and I saw it being cut up. And there isn't many things that are, you, know, you can say that are similar to a pineapple. Um, so there is evidence, but there's nothing that's accepted as conclusive at the moment. So why are we doing the expedition? We're doing it as an exercise in experimental archaeology. We're going to see whether a Phoenician ship could cross the Atlantic, get through all the gales and the like. So that's the first part. But then the other part of it is to create more interest in this whole area, to get more evidence, get you know a higher level of interest. And I think over the next few years, you know, the evidence will come forward that is really compelling, that actually will then put, you know, the Lebanese and the Phoenician culture on the right scale. Because it is the case that, you know, the Romans and the Egyptians and the Greeks, uh, they're in a lot of the national curriculums, their documentaries are made every week almost about the Egyptians, but the Phoenicians are very much overlooked. And so I'm hoping that the expedition will start to, in a little way, you know, redress this, this balance. Shed more light on the Phoenician civilization. And now you're going to tell us about your upcoming uh, expedition across the Atlantic Ocean that's going to start in September. My first question would be, why did you choose this particular route? And why not, for instance, from the Green Cap to, to uh, Brazil, which is a much shorter distance. So why from Gibraltar to the Americas? Okay. So, um, as Shane has, has just said, um, we've got the, the map here of our planned expedition. And we're going to start this in Gibraltar. Why have we chosen this uh, route? Well, there's two reasons. And this supports, I think, why the Phoenicians may well have made it across the Atlantic. There were some 200 settlements down the Spanish, Portuguese, and Moroccan coast. And places like Madeira and the Canary Islands, you know, archaeologists have proven that they colonized these areas. So with all this trade going on, I mean, there was a massive 
trade in fish, where the Phoenicians brought fish into the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. There was all of the metals, I mean, on an industrial scale, gold and silver coming from the Iberian Peninsula uh, into the Mediterranean and back here to the Middle East. So, tremendous amount, but I think that, you know, so it's partly because it, it fits with what was there. This is what was going on, and therefore, of course, they would have left from where they, you know, they had a strong seafaring base. But also, if we cast our minds back to the um, Benjamin Franklin uh, sketch of the, um, of the of the Gulf Stream, the winds and the currents will take you directly from the Canary Islands right away across to the Caribbean. Um, all you've got to do is to put your sail up and you're pretty much guaranteed that uh, a month or so later you will arrive around the Caribbean. You may arrive in Florida or you might arrive in Brazil, but you will pretty much be guaranteed. And of course, the Phoenicians were the most incredible sailors. I mean, they were the first to sail at night. As we know, they discovered the pole star, so they would have you know, known about the seasons, they would have known about you know, the best time in, 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 to, to, to go, and, and therefore that's why I think it's the most likely route. So we're going to start in Gibraltar, we're going to do a, a courtesy visit to Cadiz, which you know, was a city that was started by the Phoenicians. Um, then we go down to Mogador, where there's the, the Phoenician temple, then across to the Canary Islands, and then we're just going to let the ship sail almost by itself to see where we end up and where they may have ended up. But certainly, in a way, that's what Christopher Columbus did, and, and he ended up in uh, Haiti, as, uh, you know, Haiti as, as we know. A little bit more detail. Um, you know, we're putting together an international crew, uh, and uh, we're hoping that we'll, uh, we already have uh, one Lebanese crew member confirmed. Uh, who's here and is going to talk in a, a little, a few minutes later. Um, we're put, getting plans together to, to document this with TV and the like. Um, we are looking for some additional sponsors. I mean, the good positive news is the boat's fine and it's good, good in good measure, but we need to pay for the expedition, so we are here partly to um, raise some sponsorship. Um, and there may be some opportunities, you know, if we can get some other organizations involved for some young. Lebanese explorers to join us on one or two legs or something, so that, you know, if you like, the, the opportunity that I had as a, as a young guy uh, could be repeated and, and given to some other people. So um, that's, that's our plan, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we move forward with the q and I'd like to call to the stage uh, Remy Ahwaji. He is organizing this expedition with Captain Beal and will be on board as a crew member. Remy. Thank you, Shema. Bonsoir, Jamie. I'm going to talk about Arabic. Can you tell me who is in Sanami? Yes. First of all, thank you for the interview. I'm going to talk about this great interview. I'm going to talk about the special thanks to Mme. Shalabi Safe Tire Association. الشغل ممكن كثير رائع، الشغل مع التيم تبعهم بتعقد كلهم كثير دايناميك، يعني كثير انبسطنا لما نشتغل معهم انا والكابتن فيليب. مش حطول عليكم ابدا بس بدي اقول كلمه على السريع. اول شيء انا اول مره سمعت عن الاكسبيديشن الاولى اللي هي حوالي افريقيا كثير تحمست بس انتبهت لشغله انه ما كان في حدا لبناني مشترك على متن السفينه. فاول شيء عملته وقت قدرت اتصل بالكابتن فيليب بيل قلت له كابتن ما فيك يو كانت make this project without having somebody Lebanese on board because we as Lebanese this is this is very very important to us and, uh, thank you so uh captain can but the mishmas in a confi no our expedition can fear the bed monsieur josh for the step by the captain what is on a sort of the sheep as اللي حابب انا نعمله للاكسبيشن اللي جايه هي مش بس سبورت بس كمان حتى وجود لبنان على متن السفينه ومشاركه يعني دايركت مع الكرو تبع تبع كابتن. سو كل شيء حابب اقوله نحن هون اليوم استفيدوا منا ما تستحوا تعبوا معنا بالاخر 
ما احنا موجودين مش بس انا عم بشتري نحن عم نفتح كمان مجال لغير شباب لبنانيين يشتركوا معنا اذا في سبونسرز اذا في شركات حابه تبعت حدا من قبلها مع الاكسبيديشن ذا واي از اوبن فتاحكم معنا بالاخر ما بعرف اذا في شيء بعد لازم نقوله ميرسي كثير وان شاء الله نتذكر انه هذا البروجكت مش بس تاريخي بس كمان بيخص مستقبل لبنان وحضاره لبنان Okay, so uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, one, please. Uh, we'll start with the first question, the gentleman. Uh, hi, Raji Maas. Um, uh, can I ask, uh, what were the dimensions of the ship? That's uh, the three questions. What's the dimension to the second? Uh, I studied uh, ore geology in Leicester, so in, whenever we visited the mines of the Midlands, they told us that the Phoenicians used to come and mine there. So that's uh, And the third is that uh, how, you know, we're going to talk to you later, but if you can advertise it better on how to join the crew or part of the leg, because you know we're working on it. Different project or uh, so the, the dimensions um, are pretty um, consistent with the formula that there is for you know Phoenician boats. They were typically three times as long as they were wide. So our boat is, is nearly six meters across the beam in terms of width, and it's just under 20 meters long. So this is a sort of the formula, three to one. So they're very broad, beamy ships. Um, so that was the first question. The second question, uh, the Midlands. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I, I find, you know, this whole thing about the evidence and stuff quite sometimes frustrating because people say, well, this is, this is, you know, this is fact, this is known. And then you come across, dare I say it, some skeptical academics who are professionals. That's what they do. And they say, if you haven't got scientific evidence, then, you know, you cannot make that argument. So um, that's the frustration. Um, I haven't heard that particular thing, but certainly the legends and the stories of tin mining in Cornwall is, is well known and, and, and referred to in ancient texts. So that's that. And then um, in terms of like getting involved, we put up here on slides some of, we've got a couple of websites. There's the Save Tire uh, Foundation that we're working with as our partners here, and our own website. And um, and if you Google me or the project, you will you know we'll read an email and, and the like. So we'd be really interested to hear from any of you who can help us in any way, whether it's financially or practically or in kind, whatever you can do to help us, that's really would be great. Thank you. Next question, the gentleman there. Yes. Alex Sama. The first question is just a technical question. How high were the waves around the Cape? Around the Cape, yeah. Around the Cape. But the main question is how far from shore did you navigate when certain navigating? How, how, how far would you allow yourself to be from shore? And since this uh, voyage now uh, will be across the Atlantic, you will not have any shore for close to 2,000 kilometers. You will be just going with the wind. And the corollary question is, was, in your opinion, was the trip of the Phoenician planned or did the winds take one or two ships there by coincidence, and then the route was open to them. Yeah. So, the um, question was really about the, the first question was about the height of the waves around the Cape. Um, generally, they were about three meters high to, I mean, there was a swell of about seven meters, when, because you know there's some big rolling waves, but the, the height of the sort of individual waves would have been about three meters, so um, 10, 10, 12 foot, 
Um, but, you know, that's not a big problem, to be honest, because, because we're sailing with the wind and the waves, generally. We're not fighting them. Um, it, the, the ride on, on Phoenicia is actually, you know, more comfortable than you, you might think. Uh, how far offshore did we go? Um, well, with, for example, the Somali pirates, we had to go a thousand miles offshore, and there were still pirates out at that thing. So we don't have a problem with being off, offshore. I mean, to me, one square meter of, of sea is very much like the next. It doesn't really matter where you know, that square meter is. It, um, so we, yeah, we're quite happy to go a long, a long way off, offshore. Uh, next question, please. Oh, and I, I would just say, sorry, but you know, the Phoenicians, I mean, there is this sort of feeling that, oh, they had these little boats and they only kept in, you know, in sight of land. But actually, you know, the, the, the Greek enemies wrote that the Phoenicians were the, you know, the greatest sailors and they were the first people to sail at night and were confident of sailing outside of the sight of land. So, you know, and, and if you were going to sail uh, to the Azores, or even the Canary Islands, you're out of sight of land from, from the mainland, um, you're going to have pretty capable boats and be pretty confident. So, um, you know, we have to get away from this notion that the Phoenicians just had these little boats with the, the horses' heads on. No, they had proper ocean going and, and large, you know, trading vessels, some of them up to 30 meters long. Sorry, and was it planned? Okay. Oh, was it planned? I think initially it would have been probably by accident, by discover, you know, by accident, but then later it would have been a discovery. I mean, you know, they would have gone again once they knew. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Good morning. I have two questions. The first one is about the rookie, which I had with the gentleman. You know, historically, I'm not a Navy technically like this side. But they say that they sailed all the way north to Greenland, Iceland, the Canadian shore, and then down. And this is a Viking uh, theory, the Scottish theory, and many other. Why did you take this routine? Uh, this is a technical question, my first one. Uh, the question is about the theory. Could they have gone up to the northern route? And there are you know, historical accounts of the Phoenicians going up further north than Great Britain. But I think the probability is they didn't have the support mechanisms there to, to, to go extend much further beyond that. Or if they did, we haven't found them. You know, there's no real evidence of the Phoenicians being in that you know, upper part of the northern hemisphere. Um, yes, they could have probably done it, but I mean, it would be, for them, you know, it would have been quite cold, quite bitter. Um, for the Vikings, they were used to that kind of weather, um, and they'd have to go really far north because the Gulf Stream prohibits you crossing the Atlantic directly across, say, from the, you know from Great Britain across to New York. You can't do that because the, the currents are the, the completely, you know, uh, and the wind completely the wrong way. So you've got to, as you say, go right up to Greenland, and you can really only do that in the summer. That means you've got to be based up there. You know, there'd be a long way from home. Um, it seems unlikely, much you know, more unlikely, and much more likely that they would have gone from the Canary Islands, where they were based, and they were comfortable with that climate. My second one. Okay. You heard, uh, being one of the British Navy uh, officers, definitely you heard of the Sinclair family. Yeah. Sinclair. Uh, as a proud Lebanese, I need to ask you honestly, why you have chosen to advocate Phoenicians rather than advocating the, the British scenario, you know, of discovering the Americas before the Columbus years? Yeah. They think that I'm um, being proud yes, and yes, I'm so happy, it's yeah. easy to my head. No, I have to say, I've always been much more interested in, um, in, in the cultures and histories of uh, ancient peoples rather than, say, the Sinclair family. But also, it's much more fun to come to the Lebanon and do a project like this than to do it in <laughs> Wales or Ireland. So, <laughs> much better. Thank you.
Thank you for your intervention. I have two small questions, please. Uh, the first one, I noticed you had a solar panel plus some a new modern uh, technology. So, are you going to give it a chance to use the compass on the ancient way, etc., uh, only to test, uh, really, to have all the chances to prove your theory? This is my first question. The second one, I saw the Union Jack. So, are we going to have a promise to add the Lebanese flame during the next trip? Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, that's the answer to the first one. The last question first. Yeah, we can always add a, a, a Lebanese flag. Um, and in fact, I'm slightly embarrassed by the, how much the, the cameraman focused on that uh, British flag. But uh, from a, a legal point of view, technical point of view, it's a British registered boat, but it um, doesn't mean you can't fly the, the Lebanese flag. Um, so that's, yeah, not a, not a problem. Your first point, sorry, just. Ah, uh, technology, that's right. So, um, for, um, we, yeah, we will be doing some experimental work with astronavigation, and it's very interesting when we went around Africa, coming up towards the equator, when the first time we could see the pole star, and then we could say, ah, the Phoenicians would be comfortable now because the pole star suddenly came into view and they would know where north was. But we, from a safety point of view, but also from a communication point of view, uh, we have a satellite communications because the thing is, every day we're going to be plotting the position of the ship on our website as we go. Every, you know, every four hours we'll plot the position, and we'll also have photos of what's going on every day, and that'll be on the website. We've sent some video clips back as well. So we do have satellite communications. And the other thing is, because we have these huge um, container ships that are going over 20 knots, sometimes they don't see a little wooden boat in the sea, and therefore we need to have some communications to talk to them, to tell them we're here, and we don't want to end up as you know, matchsticks uh, in the water. So we do have modern communication. But the sailing is all traditional. There's no winch to get us out. We have to do that ourselves. Well, we'll well, sorry, when we get down to the Atlantic, sorry, down towards the equator, it won't, it'll be better. But no, the real reason for that is one of the dangers of this uh, adventure is the hurricane season that comes through. So hurricanes should be finished, I estimate, by middle of October. And um, then if we leave a little sort of after September, October from Canary Islands, hurricanes should be out of the Caribbean by then. So that's more in my mind than anything else. There's a lady here that had a question. Okay, I have a... Oh, sorry. Yes. sorry. There, you were, you, there was a lady there, yeah. Yes. I'm an archaeologist, and I was very lucky to attend the launching of your expedition from Adelaide. I was present there. And I understood then that uh, this uh, Syrian uh, association uh, was the sponsor of this project. I wonder what happened to this uh, association. That's my first question. The second question I will uh, I'll ask you after you answer this first one. Um, obviously, we built the ship in um, in, in Arwad, in, in Syria. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned partly because we couldn't do it here. But I mean, the main thing was that in our way, obviously, there was a you know a strong boat building community there. Um, the way these things work is that if you do not get the support of the government um, or some support in a country, when things go wrong, um, you need the, the support. Now, we had the support of the Syrian government but it was never in writing. It was always just acknowledged. Um, there was never any uh, thing in writing. They, it just didn't happen. It so, from there. Sorry? It sailed from there. Oh, yeah. So well, you had the support, but never mind. Sorry, what happened we, to the association? No, uh, I'm not sure what association you're referring to. British Syrian. Oh, the British Syrian Society? Yes. Um, 
But that still exists, but in a very low-key way. I mean, the British Syrian society was very much, dare I say it, tied to government individuals, putting it, you know, correctly. Uh, it, it does still exist, and I think it will continue to exist. And I think it did a lot of good work, but I think, you know, with the problems in Syria that we all know about, it's had okay. to be very much sort of softly, softly. Um, I think people just don't want to go near it. I think they really, you know, reduced their activities. My second question is more scientific. Uh, you mentioned uh, the discovery of uh, tombs, burials, temples, and inscriptions. We don't see any of these. Uh, any pictures of these? Do you have them? I do, and I can send them to you. Because these are the main, the main pieces of evidence for us to, uh, to judge as the scientific yeah. evidence. So, the, the Portuguese archaeologists have written papers, they presented them at international conferences, and... Some pictures of other from the tombs, ah. the inscriptions. Yes. The lady in blue, please, next question. Yes, yes, please go ahead. This will be our last question. However, you're all welcome to, to join us around the cocktail reception, courtesy of LAU, and continue this debate together. Okay? Okay, then the gentleman here, and then we, we end it. Please, go ahead. Lina Yunus from the National News Agency. I just want to ask you one question about the expedition that you're intending to undertake in September, maybe. Is it the, what's the point you want to make out of this expedition? Is it to prove that the Phoenician boats are capable or way capable of crossing the Atlantic and thus discover the fourth continent? Or is it you want to further explore or seek other evidence that the Phoenicians have indeed crossed the Atlantic? Um, the answer is, is both. We wanted to do the expedition as an, um, as an exercise in experimental archaeology, and we uh, am I not coming across? And we also want to personally. I want to try to to write a book to to bring together a lot of this evidence. But we want to inspire and enthuse people to to go out and and, and look for more evidence. Okay, next, so next question, the gentleman here. Thank you. Seeming fine. One, two, three months to land on the Caribbean island. How much time? Yeah, from Canary Islands, five to six weeks, something oh, Five like to six weeks, no more. Another question, did any of the Facebook or Instagram or somebody is following you as to be uh, Online, online. Yes, all the time. Yeah, thank you. Just George Peckles. Thank you. Uh, my name is George Pagul. I am the representative of the Phoenician International Research Center. And uh, Dr. Maha mentioned during the third introduction to Captain Philip that not much is known about the Phoenician history. And she's absolutely right. Not much is known about the international, the Phoenician history. You don't find many books in foreign libraries about the Phoenicians of their history. And there are two main reasons for that. Do you have a question? Yes. Do you have a particular question? Yes. Are you talking Please to continue. me? Yes. Uh, the first one, the first reason is there is continuous assault on Phoenician history and Phoenician civilization from different organizations around the world and even foreign governments. And the second reason is the reluctance of our people, our communities, to embrace the Phoenician culture and the Phoenician history. Like they have embraced other cultures, such as the French culture or the Arab, the Arab culture. So we want to thank you, Captain Philip, for doing the work for us and for showing our people that we have history, we have heritage, and we have civilization that can be, we can be proud of. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Philip, welcome back. I don't have a question, I just have a clarification. Because from what our Lebanese sailor mentioned, there was no Lebanese involvement when the ship was launched in Aroa. And there was, yes, the British Sea Association was one of the sponsors. But I met Philip eight years ago, and I used to work at uh, People's Bank Syria. And People's Bank Syria, as a Lebanese bank in Syria, sponsored the launch, and we had to be part of this exhibition expedition because Phoenicians were on the coast. Now, they were in Arwa, but they were in Seoul, they were in everywhere. And yes, there was a Lebanese participation. So Was hopefully, Biblos Bank will be also sponsoring the upcoming expedition. I don't work for Biblos Bank anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I work for the Arab Bank. Now. Okay. And Arab Bank, of course, really would well, I think want you to see Arab Bank's logo no no right on that sale. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all very much. Please, <laughs> Captain <laughs> Bill, uh, conclude, please. Yeah, just very quickly, um, just like to thank uh, Lebanese. American University for hosting this, but also thanks to the people um, who made it, if you like, possible Last for the Venetian project to be launched. Um, one was Marine Gantus, who was a sponsor at uh, Biblos Bank in Damascus at the time, and uh, George Fadu, who organized uh, the, the homecoming here in Lebanon when we got back in 2010. So I wanted to just thank all the people who were involved, and I hope that we can all work together for the future. So do come and join us for a drink. Thank you. Thank you.